Thank you so much for having me. I've followed this event for a long time, so it's great to be here. As Rosie said, my new book is all about how to stay human in an online world. And really those were the questions I wanted to ask. I, you know, it could be class of self-help, but I'm less about the answers and more about the broader discussion. So I wanted to kind of talk you through some of the questions I've been asking in the book. So first of all, I wanted to ask, what does it mean to be human? And after two years of reduced physical contact and a steep rise in our screen time, I think this question is, is really for everyone. Like what, what makes us who we are? And so much of our life is spent online now. There is no separation really between who we are online and who we are offline. It really is one big merge and how we act and how we treat each other on the internet really should reflect our offline life as well. And there's this idea of being a citizen online and offline. I wanted to write this book because for me, it always comes from a personal place and it also comes from an anecdotal place. And then I look at the research and sort of connect the dots. And there is so much research at the moment about how this is a topic on, on everyone's lips, really. How do we stay human and how do we treat each other better on the internet? So many of my friends felt dehumanized during the pandemic. And I think one friend said to me that she felt like a content farm, this idea of typing and producing and pressing buttons. And we felt like machines. We felt like we were just working during the pandemic, most of us. We weren't really out in nature as much. We weren't with our loved ones. And we weren't really our physical selves. We were socially distancing and we were literally just tapping and typing behind screens for most of it. And suddenly we're in a world of endless Zooms and we're still on it now. And hopefully we'll be in person again doing events like this. And we were static avatars. We were reduced to online arguments. One in four people on WhatsApp misunderstood each other during the pandemic and people were falling out with their loved ones because we didn't have tone of voice, we didn't have our body language. We have fake followers, we have the rise in AI and we have virtual customer service which is my, well the biggest bane of my life and really gets me when I can't speak to an actual human when I'm just trying to get my sofa fixed or whatever it might be. In 2016, I wrote a book called Control Alt Delete, How I Grew Up Online. And that was a young millennial perspective on growing up alongside the internet. I basically found out that the World Wide Web had been invented in 1989 and I was born in 1989. And I thought it would be quite interesting to see how we both grew up together, the internet in its infancy and I was in my infancy. So I wrote a book about that and I was quite giddy at the time. I was so excited by the internet and I still am. Obviously it's one of the greatest tools ever and we can do so much and we can, we can make such a positive life for ourselves. I made friends, I made a career, I could write for a living, I could work from home and it was amazing. But looking on five years since that book, actually six years since that book, and then a pandemic in between, my outlook towards the internet has changed and I have obviously grown up even more so. And it's interesting that I am in the digital native generation, which means that all of my life has spent on the internet, but it's very different from Gen Z who would have grown up with a smartphone. I didn't grow up with a smartphone. I had some sort of, um, sort of childhood before that. But when we look at this broader reflection, I think for me, it's interesting to see how much of that childhood was positively learning and being educated by the internet and how much was sowing the seeds for a later addiction. And in the book, I am quite openly honest that I do think I am addicted to the internet. I think addiction is a strong word, but there is this element of reaching for something first in the morning that doesn't sit quite right and if it was reaching for a black coffee or if it was reaching for a cigarette the way that I'm constantly reaching for my phone it was something that I wanted to look at and I wanted to analyze this relationship that I have with my internet as though it was a person it's always been there but it's always evolving and just as we renegotiate our relationship with alcohol or meat or the environment I wanted to really look at the technology I'm using through a personal lens, but hopefully share some insights as well. So I know that a huge influence for a lot of people of my generation is Zadie Smith. And I started to realize that my screen time was really impacting my creativity. 
she's someone that's always sort of shunned social media and and phones and she has said in the past in an interview that she couldn't control herself on the internet and she would go down Beyonce Google rabbit holes so she had to curb her uh, addiction to it and and otherwise she wouldn't write any books so that's sort of where it started for me to really analyze what am I doing like I'm wasting so much of my time here I'm so distracted and it's really really impacting the things that I want to do and we can see from you know all of the research at the moment we're going through the great resignation people want more from their lives people want to have hobbies they want to be creative we want to enjoy our lives and the, the elephant in the room is that we are spending a lot of time on our devices whilst also saying we don't have any time. So there is something to be said for where does our time actually go? The other thing I wanted to look at in the book is something that I was always championing, which was the personal brand, this idea of actually it's not wasting your time building this career online because it's helping you sort of maintain some sort of career. We all have to be online for our jobs mostly. So I wanted to unpick that and really look at this virtual self that we have now. In a book that I quote in, the, in, in my book, um, this book called Virtually You by Elias Obajade was a huge inspiration. He coined the phrase e-personality. And in my book, I'm kind of prompting the reader to really look at that e-personality, this self that we've created that we can actually like more than we like our offline self. We might look better. We might be more confident. We might be able to um, sum up who we are in pixels better than we can in real life sometimes. But when I realized all of these things that I wanted to change, I realized that digital detoxes did not work. It's like a diet it's not the answer. We can't just put our phone in a drawer for a month and cut everything out and hope it all fixes. But we also, most of us, can't actually step away from the internet for a month because we are so addicted. So in my book, I am giving micro detox prompts. How do you get yourself back again? How do you rediscover who you are whilst also enjoying the internet for what it is? So one of the prompts in there is about rediscovering yourself outside of algorithms so who are you outside of a Spotify playlist what music did you listen to when you were younger what books do you think you want to read without Amazon trying to tell you who you are before you stumble across something you might enjoy what do you want to wear without the influence of Instagram and a lot of it is really just stripping back all the layers of who we were before um, the Social Dilemma documentary obviously came out in early 2020, and I think that was the time where we started to really realise what was going on. Just even the idea of swiping down is the same as a slot machine. We were giving, given information that shocked us, but we weren't really given a solution at the end. And that is what I tried to do in this book. If you are feeling like you're spending too much time on your phone, but you don't want another book telling you to log off for a week and go into a cabin and have a digital detox. This is sort of a middle ground of really gentle prompts to try and just get some time back for yourself um, in, in a way that isn't really, really overwhelming. The other, the other part of it really is accountability. How much can we actually do without feeling like we can just sort of blame the tools all the time? Because we know that over-dependence on our phones causes anxiety and stress. We know that even having the phone on the table, it actually reduces our cognitive capacity. And we also know that when we are with friends and they're on their phone, we feel less connected to them. And one thing that keeps coming up is that this is not young people. This is people trying to tell their parents to get off their phone when they're trying to have a family dinner. So I hope that the book can be a middle ground. And I wanted to leave you with some sort of practical things because this is going very quickly. This, I mean, I've been talking for nine minutes already. Um, number one is to remind ourselves of what makes us human. For me, it is making mistakes. It's long form conversation. It's laughter, it's curiosity, it's forgiveness, it's creativity, it's community. It's the opposite of cancel culture in my eyes. It's also resting. It's the ability to not be productive. That's, that's what makes us human. Um, 
it's not really a compliment to call someone a machine, especially if you're an author kind of writing multiple books. You're not a machine. You're a human who probably finds it quite hard to produce things at the same rate every single day. We go through ups and we go through downs and it's not as consistent. I personally decided to split out my social media feeds between work and personal. Getting my personal sort of um, online life back actually helped me connect more deeply with the people who were sort of in my inner circle. Not everything has to be a promotion. I started journaling again. I started writing by hand again. My handwriting was terrible. Tried to get that back. I stopped being productive just to see how that would feel and kind of going into that discomfort. I also used the Marie Kondo technique where she would say, you know, to get rid of it if it doesn't spark joy. Try and do that with your feeds because we change so often. So something that would inspire us even a month ago probably won't inspire us necessarily now. Also avoid Twitter arguments or arguments of any kind that are in snippets. During the pandemic, whenever I was getting into some sort of heated debate, I actually offered to have a Google Hangout with someone, which I know for a lot of people, probably you just think I, I don't want to do that and I don't have time. But it was so brilliant and really eye opening. And I made brilliant connections because we got to go beyond the very quick nature of just disagreeing in 140 characters. Um, I tried to be more active with my phone and less passive. So instead of just doom scrolling, and just scrolling while you're, I don't know, waiting for the bus or waiting for something to heat up in the microwave. Only use your phone when you have something to actually do with it. Don't fall into that sort of glazed over, can't get out of this loop. And the other thing was to stumble acro across things more. So not everything has to be targeted to you. Go into bookshops and just buy a random book. Or um, there's a study, actually, that most people now book a holiday based on the photos they'll get that they can then share on social media. So there's lots in the book to think about of how we can change our habits without the digital detox. But my last question for you would be, how can you use the Internet to enhance your real life and your real relationships? and the person who is on the other side of the screen. So I hope I uh, crammed everything in for you there, but thank you so much for listening and back over to you, Rosie.